Hey guys, what is going on? Welcome back to another video. I hope you are doing well. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about a bunch of facts that a motor manufacturer may not necessarily want you to know. So let's go ahead and get started and talk about the first of several facts that we're gonna be going over today. So the first item is that a specification for power within our brushless motors is not necessarily something that has an industry standard. For example, if we were to look at a motor rated at 500 watts, that motor may have actually been rated at 500 watts based on a specific environment that that rating came from. And that environment may look like something like this, where the motor manufacturer has actually done it at room temperature. So somewhere between about 20 degrees degrees Celsius and 25 degrees Celsius. Another condition is that that motor manufacturer may have had a fan operating so that airflow was going over the motor as it was getting its rating. And that would be in the form of so many cubic feet of air per minute or even cubic meters of air over it per minute. Now this is where it becomes important. In order for us to get that rating, our environment has to closely mimic that environment. Now, for example, if you're operating a radio controlled vehicle, such as this one here, where the motor is very buried among a bunch of plastic components that surround it, you're gonna get absolutely no airflow over that motor. And the second thing is, if you take this radio controlled vehicle and you operate it on a day where it's over 40 degrees Celsius, you may also have an ambient temperature that is significantly different than the ambient temperature that that motor had been tested for. And if that sun was piercing through the body of your specific radio control car and underneath that body it was even getting hotter that would also change the environment that that motor is actually running in. What you may find is that 500 watt rated motor that's inside your radio control vehicle may only be able to put out a maximum of 400 because it's operating in a lot different of an environment than that motor was tested in. And it's important for us to know and understand that because as we go and approach the summer months of the year, we're gonna be operating our equipment in much different environments than when it was a little bit cooler out. Even about 10 degrees can make such a drastic and major difference to us. This is why this is very important. Now, on the flip side, we can move right into fact two, where you can have the opposite actually occur. So for example, I have a motor here that this here operates around 600 to about 650 watts continuously for the entire entire duration of a battery pack. Now typically motor manufacturers for this specific motor size would rate this motor around the 500 watt mark. So that begs the question of how are we able to get a lot more out of that motor? Well, it certainly has to do with the type of application that we install this motor in and how we actually treat that motor for heat. For example, this motor is actually installed in a radio controlled boat. And within that boat, we have a cooling jacket that goes right on the outside of the motor so that we get water come in contact with the case of the motor. And then as it travels, as the water travels through its circuit, it can actually take and remove heat away from the motor and get rid of it out of the boat. So that's a way that we're able to boost the amount of power that we can get out of this motor. Water cooling simply allows us to take and remove more waste heat from the motor. Because we're able to take more waste heat out, the temperature drops. Therefore, in order to maintain the same temperature or at least get the maximum potential out of the motor, we increase the power levels and that's what gets us back to the same operating temperature. And the big benefit is it's going to be more than what the specification would tip Typically be for a motor of this size. Now a little side note to keep in mind is that motor manufacturers may also give you peak numbers versus continuous numbers. It's very important to understand if you're looking at the continuous rated power specification or a peak power specification. If you are looking at peak power output of a brushless motor, you will want to keep in mind the actual duration of time that can elapse for that peak power to be sustained. Again, we don't wanna go over the limitations of the thermal capabilities within our motor. Otherwise, we get ourselves into problems. Just another little thing to keep in mind when you're talking about specifications for those motors. Let's talk about the next fact that we have here. Motor manufacturers don't specifically want you to know that you could possibly run more voltage than that motor was specifically rated for. Now, I'm not talking about the ratings of a motor that come from a specific data set and have 
have been calculated and worked out correctly. You will see a lot of that on motor manufacturers spec sheets and that is correct. What I'm talking about is a motor manufacturer such as the one that makes this one here rating this specific motor for 4S. Now if you were to do the math, 4S at 2650 kV gets you just shy of 40,000 RPM. However, I see on the back of this case here that it's rated for a maximum of 60,000 RPM. The question is, what is actually happening here with this motor? Well, previously on the channel, we have learned that voltage is not specifically responsible for destroying a motor. At the core, where voltage is actually related but not responsible, is the mechanical limitations of this motor. If you exceed the 60,000 RPM, you could possibly destroy the bearings of the motor or internally to the motor, the rotor that is also spinning. Now, if we wanted to see how this is related back to voltage, because voltage is what is going to multiply against the KV, we would then be able to come out with the correct maximum voltage for this motor. In this case, we take 60,000 RPM, we divide that by the KV of the motor, which is 2650 in this case, and we get somewhere around the 22 point something volts of a maximum for us. Now this would definitely be acceptable for a 5S battery pack and if you really wanted to, you'd be right on the limit at 22.2 volts. However, if your motor had zero load and a maximum full battery, you will exceed that 60,000 RPM, which is a never exceed RPM. Now we get to the question, why would a motor manufacturer want to specify this specific motor at a maximum of 4S when we have just made a calculation that says this motor can handle 5S lithium polymer battery pack? Well, the reason for this is because if you look at getting that motor up to around that 50 to 60,000 mark, this would be outside of the range of majority of vehicles that that motor can fit in. In other words, if you put that motor into a vehicle that it was intended to go in, you would be loading up that motor significantly. And if you load that motor significantly based off of the stock gearing of the motor, you can draw a lot of current, which then can lead to destruction of that motor through building up too much heat. What the motor manufacturer has done is place that 4S max rating so that you get the output RPM of the motor in a range that is gonna be suitable for a lot of radio control vehicles that are offered on the market. This makes it a lot more reliable and safer for the typical average user. We need to make sure that we're respecting the motor manufacturer's specifications on the motor. And if you go above and beyond the specifications of that motor, you are essentially accepting all risks and responsibility for any failure that occurs with that motor or anything else outside of the motor. Let's go ahead and talk about the next point that we have, and that is relating to the IO value of brushless motors. There is no set standard, just like we talked about with the wattage specifications, but with the IO value, within the RC industry. What this means is that motor manufacturers provide IO values out there at varying voltage values. For example, you may see a rating for this specific motor that says the IO value is X amount of amps at eight volts. And then you look at another motor manufacturer and it's at 10 volts. And then the next one you see is at 12 volts and so on. You, you get what I'm saying. So what this really comes down to is a couple things. First of all, motor manufacturers have different values that they like to rate their IO values based off of, and that's the voltage values that are varying. But also is that those motors, if you look at a specific can size, so one model of motor, and you look through all the different motor, windings that they have, they will only provide you with the IO value rated at one specific voltage. However, the motor that has the most amount of windings versus the least amount of windings is going to be operating on a different voltage. If you want to get the most accurate specification, it is in your best interest to measure the IO value at the exact voltage that you plan to run. Now the last point that we have for you today is that motor manufacturers don't specifically want you to know that you can actually compare against two manufacturers that both have identical motors with identical KVs just by looking at the wind type. Well, one motor manufacturer may not want you to know this, but the other one may want you to know this. And the way that you're able to do that 
For example, is if you had a motor that let's say had a 40 millimeter diameter by 74 millimeters long, and you found two manufacturers that have that exact size, and they also have the same KV value. Let's say that KV value happens to be 3000 KV. If you look at both of those specific motors, and one of them has a winding configuration of a one Y wound motor, and the other motor has a two Y round motor, you would be able to see that the motor manufacturer that has achieved those specifications with one turn terminated in a Y configuration has achieved a more efficient motor. Now, the way that we would understand and know that the motor has a better efficiency with the lesser turn count is because both motors, in order to achieve maximum efficiency, would have to be filled entirely with copper to the maximum. And if you can fill the entire cavity with copper, and this is through the windings, with only using one turn, that means you can go to a larger diameter of wire that makes up that one turn. Where the motor manufacturer that does it in two turns has to run two turns worth of winding material, and that is going to be of a lesser diameter. Therefore, they would not be able to pass as much current through that specific motor, and that would lead to a buildup of more heat if you tried to match the same amount of current between both of those motors. This is often what I do when I'm selecting a motor across a multiple different manufacturers and I want to try and pick the one that is the most efficient. I'm looking for the one that can have the least amount of resistance so that I can get the most amount of power out of it. Next time you're comparing motors, take a look and see if you can notice different turn counts when the KVs are identical and the physical size of the motor is also identical. It's not perfect, but it gets us within the ballpark, especially if the only thing that we have to use to figure it out is just a specification table. Well guys, that pretty much sums it up for this video today. I hope you enjoyed this video talking about certain things that motor manufacturers may not necessarily want us to know. Like the video if you do, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that I can see you in that next video. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next Monday.